I'd like to give people the opportunity to ask any questions if they have any. I have a question about meditation, uh, the jhana levels. If, for, for more experienced advanced meditators at the time of death, if they are able to go in and out of jhanas very easily, does that mean that they are able to determine their rebirth? Because if they are able to be in the first jhana, for example, at the time of death, does that mean they surely be reborn in the first rupa loka? Is, yeah. is that? Yeah. So, so the, the question is, for people, for people who have the jhanic absorptions, uh, samadhi, uh, the, the collectedness, when they're dying, uh, do they? The question was, if the, if they die in the first jhana, do they do they get born as a Brahma Deva? In the first, so the the answer would be yes. But if a if a if a practitioner is established on the is established on the path, if they've already established their mind in nibbana, uh, they wouldn't necessarily be born as a Brahma. <coughs> For somebody with, I think it's quite common for the advanced spiritual practitioners to have put some thought before they die into where they want to go or where would be most useful. And then, uh, then if that was the case, I don't think they would be dying in the jhanic state, but they would, they, they would be able to maintain <coughs> upajara samadhi, like very close to jhana but not being absorbed. But it's, the, it's through the power of the determination that probably they would have a peaceful meditation and then after the peaceful meditation they would consider and then they determine the merit to where, where they want to go. So the mind is the forerunner. The mind becomes like what it attends to. And if a spiritual practitioner is very advanced, I believe they can choose where they want to go. So. And a, even a Tushita heaven appears to be the heaven where the devas in that heaven realm can choose the time of their rebirth as well. So, um, my teacher says if you want, <clears throat> for people who aspire to heavenly rebirth, he, he recommends Tushita heaven. Doesn't recommend Dawatimsa heaven. Dawatimsa heaven is a bit too sensual. Uh, the Tushita heaven is uh, the heaven of the contented. Uh, the devas in Tushita heaven are experiencing a state similar to Pajara Samadhi. They're experiencing contentment, only wholesome thoughts, and they're surrounded by good companions. And apparently, they can choose an opportune time to take an next birth as well. So, from what I've heard. So. But I, you do need some significant merit, some samadhi, and great faith to be born in Tushita. But uh, you can do it. You can do it. So. <laughs> I have a question about merits and uh, specific transference of merits mm -hmm. transference of merits so uh, we do practice the transference of merits after meditation but uh, on the other hand Lord Buddha thought that uh, I'm the owner of my karma uh, uh, whatever karma I shall do I shall be the benefactor of that. So, my question is, uh, when we transfer our merits to our departed or our relatives, uh, that, or even those who are still living, does that really work? Yeah. It does. The, the, the thing about karma, Lord Buddha says about karma, is that it's, it's, it's too kind of complicated to understand in all of its sophistication and nuance. So, <clears throat> dedicating and transferring merit does help if we have the karmic connection with those beings. So that would mean, what that probably means is they've helped you in the past. Understanding the samsara is very long. And they're in a situation now where they can receive something from you. So if that, if that is the situation, as of, often the case with parents, grandparents, people that we have a affinity with, karmic connection to, merits can be shared. And it's, it's not that difficult to, you know, you've got your umpals that you give out on Chinese New Year, right? It's like, they have to earn their own living. They have to, 
But you can give them a gift if you want to, right? So similar to that. And uh, I think there's one sutta where somebody asked, is it possible that... Someone is asking, he's saying there's certain types of beings in certain states that can't receive merit. But the Buddha said, even if you dedicated the merit, it will benefit some beings who have a karmic connection with you, even if those ones don't get it. Some, some beings will get it. And in, in terms of generating, there's an interesting thing to understand, like sometimes we think, should I give away all my merit? Maybe I should keep some for myself. And it's like, actually, you produce the merit, and mer merit will manifest as a bright, happy mind state. That's, that you should be feeling the merit, right? <clears throat> but when you dedicate the merit, you have a bright, happy mind state. It's like you, you increased your merit. It just doesn't, it doesn't deplete it. So it's just, I think it's one of the reasons there's a, a central Buddhist practice in, the, in this area of dana and that we, do we consciously produce punya. A Lord, there's another thing Lord Buddha said is we shouldn't criticize people who do things for the sake of making merit. And he made a very interesting statement. Merit is synonymous with happiness. And people want to experience some happiness and we need merit. So we do things, we do things to consciously produce merit. And uh, sometimes Westerners, Westerners can be a bit cynical. They don't want to produce merit for the sake of getting something in the future. They think that's selfish. So they don't produce the merit. And it's like, but actually that's stupid. It's like, we have to be careful about having intelligent views which are unwise. We, we can't have the purest of intentions straight away. We do have mixed intentions. But it's the producing of the merit is what brightens the mind and then with a brighter mind and with meditation practice we purify our intentions over a period of time. But producing the merit plays an important role in that. And then dedicating it. Dedicating it is kind of a way of not to become too identified with it, too proud of it. It's like if you, every time you make merit you're sharing it with all beings. It's, like, it's kind of humbling as well. It's not just about you. So, yeah. But I would say that we don't, just, we don't just perfunctorily do the chant because I do think that sometimes, I've been trying to explain to people lately, Ajahn, these are the names of the people I'm making merit for, please do the chant. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not how it works. You've made the merit. Now you have to transfer the merit. And the monks doing the chant is helping you focus. And maybe we give it a bit of a push, but the person who makes the merit has, so you really have to recollect it and you really have to intend to share it and then you really have to share that goodness consciously. We don't just do imina punyagame no bhajaya ganutara. It's not going anywhere. We really do need to think of mother, father, teachers, chant it slowly, really mean it. Then it's a, then it's a real spiritual practice. So, yeah. Lumpur Cha, an interesting story, wonderful story. Lumpur Cha had malaria and was dying. He, he laid, he was in the middle of a jungle, <clears throat> about a day's walk away from a village, and he didn't have the strength to get there. And uh, it's very interesting, I mean, he was an extremely considerate, uh, circumspect bhikkhu. He burnt his monk's ID because he didn't want, he didn't want the person who found the corpse to have to feel burdened of letting the relatives know who it was. So he burnt his monk's ID, lay down and intended to die. And he suddenly felt a burst of energy and uh, got up and walked to the village. When he eventually got home, he doesn't say this, but I suspect it's the case. I suspect he saw some vision of his mother. But when, when he went home, he, uh, the mum said, yeah, we thought you were dead. So we went to the temple and made offerings for you and shared the merit with you. So that, I mean, here you have a, a really wonderful example of mother and son and a loving concern and uh, what, what merit mental energy can do, even to a sick body, that manifested as real energy. 
He made it to the village, he got some good herbal medicines, he recovered, he got back home, he became Ajahn Chah, the famous Arahant. But his mum helped him. And that's kind of a mother's intuition. She probably didn't know, but she probably had a deva on her case saying, Mum, 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 go to the temple, go to the temple. This is important, we need this one. It's, it's kind of the way things manifest as intuitions, like go to the temple, make the merit, share the merit on that day. It's very interesting. So. <laughs> So my question is, um, is there a difference in the way we practice in the evening before we sleep versus we practice in the morning? So the second question is, um, how do I overcome sloth and torpor? Yeah, because I usually tend to fall asleep in the evening. Yeah, yeah that's, so that's, it, that's exactly what I was saying. If you leave it to the end of the day, the mind is tired. So people will when they try to meditate late at night at the end of the day after they've done everything else, when they sit, oh. And it, it is good that people are trying to make that effort, but it's more efficient if people do it in the morning. So we, we go to bed earlier, get up earlier, wash your face. This is one of the ways we wake up. We consciously wake up, wash your face, brush your teeth, if nothing else, just to wake up. And then... Uh, doing some chanting before the meditation as well. So it's like, and you don't have to, sometimes people don't want to do the chanting because they feel, oh, well, I don't feel inspired. My mind's so, they don't, they don't, you don't want to go to the blessed one, the Lord. But believe me, I've heard plenty of morning chantings that didn't sound inspiring. But the, the point is, you're making the effort and you're waking up the mind and uh, we don't have to always look or sound inspiring, we, we have to make the effort. That's what makes the mind inspiring later. Establish the habit. And so, yeah, doing some chanting, washing the face, meditating in the morning. And then, as I was saying, if you learn to cultivate that presence of mind and carry it with you throughout the day, like just feeling those footsteps, noticing when you're sitting, noticing when you're opening and closing things, when you come to sit at night, you're not actually as tired and you're less likely to have heavy sloth because you still have some energy in the body, in the, in the mind and body. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's hard in the beginning and we, we, we kind of just have to get through it. And remind yourself, like, uh, when, when you're... When you're Getting up early in the morning, you're meditating, and the mind doesn't feel bright, and you feel a bit grumpy. It's like, this is, this, every single great practitioner started there. You're in good company. Everybody started with a mind that was affected by greed, hatred, and delusion, and the five hindrances a lot. And it was only through resolving to practice, even when it was uninspiring. It was one of, one of my favorite Ajahn Chah quotes. When you're peaceful, meditate. When you're not peaceful, meditate. When you want to meditate, meditate. When you don't want to meditate, meditate. When you're diligent, meditate. And when you're lazy, meditate. Because that's, that's the practice that becomes the powerful practice. And there's tremendous benefit. You might not see it in the moment. But the tremendous benefit is you become mindful of a whole range of mind states. You know what a sleepy mind state is. You know what a lazy mind state is. You know what an irritated mind state is. And that becomes knowing what a rapturous mind state is, what a tranquil mind state is, what an absorbed mind state is, what a, what a liberated mind state is. That's, that's the practice that becomes that. So, let us all meditate a lot. So, uh, dear, Long, dear Long Pok, welcome to Singapore. My question is, um, what is the best thing to say to your loved one who is dying? Um, is it to remind your loved one um, about the virtues of Triple Gem? Or is it to remind your loved one of the merits? Yeah, yeah so, you know, what, what is the best thing to share with your loved one? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, both of those. In Sri Lanka, I've heard that there's a lovely tradition where people actually keep a little book where they write down the various types of merit that they make. And then somebody reads that to that person towards their death. They're not capable of reading it themselves. And someone's saying, do you remember way back in 1982 when you sponsored a Katina? 
Do you remember back in 1987 when you went on the four holy sites pilgrimage? You know, recollect that and feel glad. It's a good thing to do. So sometimes we do all sorts of good things and we, we forget about it after a few years. And if the mind's a bit dull and sleepy and weak and challenged with painful feelings and sometimes drugs, we might not be able to remember those things. And also if there's some dementia, the beginnings of dementia, so kind of chatting with them about the good things that they did and reminding them of that good thing. This is called Chaganusati, recollecting the goodness, is recollect, recommended by Lord Buddha. And we don't do it to be special or become conceited, but we do it to gladden the mind. It's like, I, yeah, the conventional me did some wholesome things. It's true. That was generous, that was kind, that was skillful. And to feel glad about that. And, and this, is a, this is very interesting because when you recollect the good things that you've done, it's almost like you're, you're bringing that merit up in the mind. You're kind of making that merit ripen a bit faster. And so the, the mind, when, the, when it leaves the body, will have more merit, kind of present. So it's very skillful. And if the person is a practitioner, yeah, we remind them where the real refuge is. And we, we, so that I, I frequently visit in my village people as they approach their death. Like we, I started training them a few years ago. Rather than ask me to chant when the person is dead, uh, is it okay with you if I come and chant to them while they're still alive? And we made it a habit of, after the arms round, going to their house and, you know, just explain, teaching how to meditate in a lying down posture. Like, be aware of your breath, on the in-breath boot, on the out-breath dough. And, and for them, it's, it's a, they feel a connection with me. I've been there for 12 years. Many of them have put food in my bowl every day. So I'm able to say to them, you've put food in my bowl every day for 12 years, you know. Please recollect that now. I'm confident that when you recollect that merit, that'll help you. And they kind of smile. And they feel glad to be reminded of that. And uh, I mean, Thailand is a different situation to Singapore. In rural Thailand, much less developed. So they, they actually let people die in their homes. And, uh, and it's the tradition in Thailand to keep the body in the home for three days after death as well. But they, they, they do come and put some preservative and they put it in a refrigerated coffin, but they, they leave it at home. And uh, so, yeah, we, we train them, recollect uh, the Buddha with Buddha, because most of them are familiar with that. You know, on your in breath, but on your out breath, do, and recollect the merit that you've made and feel glad about it. And. Um, there's a man who, there's a man in the area who's kind of like a master of ceremonies for funeral chanting and he, he commented that he started to notice that the faces of the corpses that he sees in the village where we live uh, look happier. There's kind of a brightness, lightness, a little bit of a smile. And uh, it's, it was very interesting. And I think that's, I mean, that's the difference between chanting with them before they die and coming and chanting after they've already it's a bit late then. And, uh, so yeah, but while, while they're still capable of recollecting the good things they did, you can ask them, how many, how many retreats have you done? How many pilgrimages have you done? How many katinas did you attend? Which temple did you go to? Like just get the information so that you can remind them. Do you remember when you, do you remember when you did that? Can you try to bring that to mind? Feel glad about that? And then another thing, of course, is setting the intention, setting the intention to continue, continue Buddhist practice in the next life. So I don't think we need to think too much about the, the details at, at most people's level. The advanced practitioners, it's, it's different. But at most people's level, I think simply setting the intention, may I be reborn in a situation where I will meet the Buddha Dhamma and well-practiced practitioners and where I have the opportunity to practice. Other than that, you don't need to know which country, which gender, which, who the parents are. Just, may I be born in a situation where I will meet the Dhamma, well-practiced practitioners and have the opportunity to practice. I think that's enough, yeah. And while we're alive, we have to do that after, after our meditations, when our mind is peaceful, set that, set that intention again and again. So, yeah. How do you know you're practicing well? and yet encouraging yourself to commit to the practice 
because during COVID, I was drawn towards meditation. I had more time to meditate. But also when listening to Dharma talks, I also come to recognize if part of the breath meditation is not about getting rid of the thoughts, neither is it getting rid of feelings. And I'm not even thinking of advancing or hitting any jhana state. <laughs> if it's not about striving, then is it always just about the breath and working towards just a general feeling of, yeah, I feel good in my body. Because most of the times, we are not able to practice like yourself. Um, <laughs> we have quite busy lives. So how do I know I'm practicing well? Right. If it's not about getting rid of thoughts, not about getting rid of feelings. Right. So is it back to just the breath? No, so it's a, yeah. a quality of presence of mind. So do you have a good quality of presence of mind? And uh, so is, is there some clarity? And is there some... Lumpur Anan, my teacher says, you know, a large part of practice is learning how to keep the mind in the middle, not falling into too much delight, not falling into too much irritation and aversion. So that's, that's a good kind of a litmus test. How well are you able to keep your mind in a somewhat balanced state? not falling too much into passions and sensuality, not falling into uh, irritation, aversion, anger, hatred. Like how, how even are your mind states? And is there a presence of mind that recognizes them quickly? Like you actually know what your mind state is. So it's like, you don't have to get rid of thoughts, but it's really good if you know if it's wholesome, neutral or unwholesome. So in, in Thai, they're often talking about sati sampajanya, it's a Pali word. Mindfulness with clear comprehension. So it's like there's the awareness of the thought, but there's also the awareness it's a skillful thought, it's an unskillful thought. That kind of presence of mind, as opposed to being completely lost and not realizing until the end of the day, I shouldn't have done that. No, that wasn't skillful. Oh, I really got caught up in that. That's, that's how you know your practice isn't going well. If at the end of the day you review it, it's like, oh, 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 oh. That's not good practice. <laughs> but if you, in the middle of it, there's a bit of a struggle, restrain the unwholesome, try to be, there's a skillful efforts, trying to be patient, trying to be careful, trying to be considerate. That's, that's how I think you know your practice is coming into your life. There's an effort where you're trying to be thoughtful and not, not hurt people's feelings unnecessarily and not be impatient. And, but the, I do think the morning meditation session is necessary in order to be able to accomplish that. We do, we do need to practice with meditation objects to clarify and deepen the mindfulness, the presence of mind. We need to make an, we need to make an effort to make the presence of mind present. We do, and then, then we set the intention to carry it throughout the day. So I agree that you probably don't have time to meditate five times a day, like I do. But you do have time to meditate twice a day. You do. <laughs> I know you do. Well, we, we need to have a look at how we are spending our time. How much time are we on our devices? How much time are we on our social media? And I think doing certain things like setting limits after 8 p.m., not looking at your phone. Just set a limit. After eight, I don't do that. You'll find that more time has opened up. When you get up in the morning for the first hour, don't look at your phone. Because these things take a lot of time. And they also feed greed, hatred and delusion because there's something you see that you like, there's something you see that you get upset about. It's like, it's stimulating reactions. So a bit of, Lord Buddha talks about sense restraint as a power, Indriya Samwara the power of sense restraint. We don't, we don't realize that, that if we just protect the mind a bit from impingement, it gets powerful, because it's not being buffeted around and scattered. We just allow it to be in the body, allow it to be with a meditation object, and you have the power of sense restraint. So there are things that we can do to support the development of clarity and bring it into our life. So be careful with the devices, and uh, 
I don't want to leave you to your own devices. I want you to turn off your devices and uh, meditate more. You will experience more clarity. So. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. So, okay, so uh, if anyone would like to hear more from Tanajan, uh, you're welcome to visit him, I believe, in Anandagiri Forest Monastery in Pechabun, Thailand. If you want to look him up online, you can look up uh, Peace Beyond Suffering. Just Google for it and then you'll find his website and his teachings are all there.